Indiana Humanities has been a champion for the humanities for more than 45 years. There's no better vehicle to bring people together than the humanities. They teach us optimism and empathy. They teach us how to consider facts and draw our own conclusions. They spark creativity, lead to personal enrichment, and a greater connection to place. Through our work at Indiana Humanities, we initiate, support, and highlight thought-provoking and impactful programs in all 92 counties around the state. We bring in interesting speakers. We experiment with different formats, provide grants and resources to other nonprofits, partner with unique organizations, and serve as a megaphone for humanities events, organizations, and news. Our mission is simple. We want to encourage Hoosiers to think, read, and talk. But our impact is extraordinary. More access to humanities-based programs leads to stronger communities, and a stronger Indiana. We are dedicated to renewing America by continuing the quest to realize our nation's highest ideals, honestly confronting the challenges caused by rapid technological and social change, and seizing the opportunities those changes create. We, we, work work for, for, we work for a society that promotes economic opportunity for all. Equitable, accessible, high quality education and training over a lifetime. Equal representation in politics and participation in accountable governance. Universal access to digital technology and its benefits across all communities. A secure, prosperous America that lives up to its values and commitments at home and abroad. We are a new kind of think and action tank, a civic platform that connects a research institute, technology lab, solutions network, media hub, and public forum. We generate big, bold ideas. We design and advance evidence-based public policies. We surface, share, and scale locally generated and tested solutions to public problems. We tell stories about what is happening and what is possible to give Americans a window into what we are capable of achieving together and a vision of what a renewed America could and should be. On behalf of Indiana Humanities, New America Indianapolis, Ball State University, Ruoff Home Mortgage, I'm pleased to welcome you to tonight's In Conversation with James and Deborah Fallows. My name is Ryan Venatter, Ball State grad, 1997, and I'm here on behalf of Ruoff Home Mortgage, who are proud to sponsor the Our Towns Indiana Tour a four-city tour across the Hoosier State with the authors of Our Towns, A 100,000-Mile Journey into the Heart of America. As you'll soon hear, James and Deborah Fallows care deeply about what it takes for cities and towns to thrive and prosper. And they're curious about what's happening in the heartland of America, in cities like Muncie that are often overlooked in the national conversation. That's something we at Ruoff Home Mortgage also care deeply about, as does Indiana Humanities and New American Indianapolis, who partnered to bring the Fallows to Indiana. James Fallows, a national correspondent for The Atlantic Magazine, is a writer and journalist. His work has appeared in many outlets over the years, including The Slate, the New York Times Magazine. He is also former editor of US News and World Report. He has also written several books, including several about his time in China, about the war in Iraq, and his love of flying. Deborah Fallows, who with James is the parent of two sons, is a linguist by training and an author. Before co-authoring Our Towns with James, she worked with the Pew Internet Project 
and wrote a book about child rearing in the working mom age, among many other diverse projects. Tonight's event is the kickoff to Inseparable, a new two-year initiative from Indiana Humanities that invites Hoosiers to explore how to relate to each other across boundaries, real or imagined, and consider what it takes to indeed be inseparable in all the ways that matter. The Our Towns Tour is the perfect kickoff. Over four days, we'll be visiting large cities, mid-sized cities, and small towns who exemplify the sort of can-do creative approach to solving problems that will help our communities and our state thrive in the 21st century. During tonight's event, James and Deborah will be interviewed by Dr. Jeffrey Mearns, the president of Ball State University. Dr. Mearns arrived in Muncie in May of 2017, becoming the 17th president of Ball State. Under his leadership, the university has developed a new strategic plan, Destination 2040. Our flight path provides a strategic framework identifying five long-term goals and a set of imperatives to be accomplished by 2024. Among Dr. Mearns' commitments and his passion for advancing Ball State's relationship with the community, at his installation in 2017, he launched the Better Together Initiative, a highlight of which is enhanced support for Muncie Community Schools, which I'm sure you'll hear more about during tonight's conversation. Dr. Mearns will talk with James and Deborah for a while, then open up the questions for the audience. If you'd like to ask a question, we ask that you step to one of the microphones so that it can be heard by everyone in the room and those watching the live stream. Following tonight's event, copies of Our Town will be for sale and James and Deborah will sign books. On behalf of Indiana Humanities, New America Indianapolis, Ball State University, and Ruoff Home Mortgage, thank you for coming out tonight. Without further ado, please help me welcome James Fallows, Deborah Fallows, and Jeffrey Mearns to the stage. So thank you, Ryan, and thank you to Ruoff Mortgage, Home Mortgage, for sponsoring this event. I also want to express my appreciation to our colleagues at Indiana Humanities and New America for helping to arrange uh, this special event. Thank you all for joining us here in the room and those who are watching or listening to the broadcast. Uh, we're delighted that you're, with, yeah, that you're with us for this very special occasion, and it's special because what we're going to do this evening is have a conversation about how people in cities and towns just like Muncie, cities and towns all across our country, are coming together to build a brighter future. To build a brighter future for themselves, a brighter future for their children, and a brighter future for their grandchildren. And although we're on a university campus, this is not going to be an academic conversation. <laughs> we're not going to be talking about public policy and lobbying our elected officials in Washington or Indianapolis. We're going to be talking about what communities can do on, their, on the ground, in their own cities. And it's going to be a conversation, it's going to be stories, stories of persistence and patience, stories of creative innovation, stories of courage, stories of faith. One of the things, if you've read the book, and one of the things you'll hear tonight, that it's a story about faith, a willingness to believe that within your community, you have the people and the programs and the resources to build that brighter future. It's a story of hope and optimism, and in fact, one of the phrases that we'll talk about today is a story about willed optimism, if you've read the book, willed optimism, that conscious decision to believe that within our own communities, we can build that brighter future, and we're so fortunate that Jim and Deb Fallows are here to participate with us in that conversation. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me once again in welcoming Jim and Deb Fallows. So my job is to ask some questions that if you were sitting in my chair, if you had the good fortune, you might also be asking. And then, as you heard, you'll have the opportunity to ask some questions as well. So I thought I'd start at the beginning. What prompted you to embark on a 100,000-mile journey 
all across the heartland of America about community revitalization. What, what prompted you to take on that mission? You will see the shtick that Deb and I are going to do this evening, which is I will often, I'll begin by answering a question, then Deb will say, well, actually, the answer is this or that. So that, that's how we've gotten along all these years. Let me say first, we're so grateful to be here in Muncie and at Ball State. It feels as if we've met most of you today in the interviews around the community. And so we're, we're honored to be here and have a chance to talk about the way things we've seen around the rest of the country might apply in Indiana and Muncie and in communities beyond. The short version of the story that we told in this book and a number of Atlantic articles over the past five years is that over the many years Deb and I have been together around the world, we lived in China for a long time, in Japan, in Malaysia, in Europe, sometime in Africa, we've always believed in hitting the road, of just getting out and seeing what it's like if you're in a village, if you're away from the big cities. So starting now almost six years ago, we decided to try to take that same approach in the US. We've have a house in Washington, D.C., where we've lived off and on over the years. We've flown a little propeller airplane for many years. And if anybody here is a pilot, it's a Cirrus airplane with a parachute for the entire plane, which was uh, one, of our, and I've landed, uh, one of our safety measures. I've landed at Muncie, Muncie over the years. But we decided it was time just to get on the road and see what life was like in non-coastal America if you went there not asking people about national politics. So the, the shortest version of, of what we, we did starting in 2013 was to say, if we went to cities that number one, it had some kind of challenge, factory closing, mine closing, environmental challenge, you name it. And number two, cities that weren't covered by the media normally, that the national media would go there only if there was a hurricane, or a flood, or a shooting or other tragedy, or a national political race. You know, how do you feel about national politics? If we went to cities to say, okay, let's go and see what Muncie is like as an actual city, what Sioux Falls is like, what Duluth is like, what Greenville, South Carolina is like. So it was just getting out on the road by air. That was the original idea. Deb, what's the correct version? <laughs> that, that's the correct version. And when we um, started this, Jim put a little piece on the Atlantic where he writes long pieces and short pieces describing what we were about to launch on and, and invited people to write into us to, to nominate their towns if they, had an, if, if they had an interesting story to tell or they thought that their town was interesting in one way or another. And within about a week, we had more than 1,000 essays back from people describing why we should go to Muncie or to Sioux Falls or to Holland, Michigan. And at that point, we thought maybe we were on to something, that people were eager to talk about their towns, that they had stories to tell. And that's what started us on, out on the road. So um, as many of the people in this room knows, and as we talked about uh, earlier today, when Jennifer and I first arrived here in Muncie in May, we had the good fortune of going on a bus tour with as guests of the Ball Brothers Foundation. And we came away feeling more optimistic, being out on the ground here in Muncie, more optimistic about the future. Today we gave you, as you mentioned, a very busy day from 8 o'clock to about 4.30, touring the city, meeting with people, business leaders, community leaders, pastors. Tell our friends here what your initial impression was, other than that you needed a a deep breath and perhaps a nap. Wait. Is this a question that could get us into trouble? <laughs> so, so Deb and I have been try, tried to be very careful over our journalistic um, careers of having an awareness of how much we don't know. And so, for example, during we lived in China for a total of almost four years, starting in, in 2006. And I did a piece for The Atlantic early on saying, OK, you're allowed one piece as a China correspondent saying, here are my first impressions. And then you have to go on and say, OK, I'm going to spend uh, months in factories. I'm going to spend months in coal mines and, and write about them. So the places we wrote about in our book are usually cities where we spent a couple of weeks. And we've, it's been now about 24 hours that we've been on, <laughs> on the ground in, in, in Muncie. And, and certainly, there is a lot we have seen here that makes us understand the excitement, the drama, the many um, contrary tensions you all are, are working with. For example, the geothermal heating project you have at the university is really incredible. Um, the, the way in which there's one thing which on 
24 hours observation is like things we've seen in other very successful cities, is the conscious effort of people from a diff the different institutions in the town, the university, the community college, the philanthropies, the faith institutions, the businesses, the NGOs, uh, the mayor's office, the county office to say, how can we together find ways to pool our efforts to address what are the long-term challenges? So I think um, Deb has a chapter in our book about Columbus, Ohio, talking about the, how the word collaboration is so omnipresent there, people just say collab to say, save time. And I think we heard almost as many collabs today as we, we had in Columbus. We yeah. did. You took my line there. Oh, right. sorry. Yeah. <laughs> That's sorry. okay. Forget the last 10 seconds. <laughs> think of, yeah, like men yeah, in black. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So um, the way I often, my background is in linguistics, so I listen really hard in all the places we go to of the vocabulary people use and, and the phrasing that they use. And I have to tell you that that word, collaborate, came out probably more frequently than any other in the conversations we heard today. And not only that, but also the very positive language that you heard, that we heard here. There, there wasn't a, a kind of, well, we don't do that here, or we can't try that here. It was much more a, a, a word I heard several times which surprised me. We are blessed here with all of the assets that come, come at this town from, from so many different directions. And, and that's not a word we normally heard in a lot of other towns. A few, but, but it's an unusual word. And um, th the other thing was the word quality of life. You know, we heard in many towns so often um, talking about needing the economic development and needing, which, you know, I know you, we heard here too, but pairing that or having that on some kind of equal balance with, with the efforts towards improving the quality of life seemed, struck me as, as not only positive, but being in a really good position to get to pay attention to the kind of next layer of issues that aren't necessarily life and death, but they're a richer life. So I um, think the, the vocabulary that you Hoosiers use is great. And, and I, I found that interesting. And could I use that to, to, just to emphasize how entirely right Deb is in this, in this astute observation, which is that something that, that that we realized just at the end of the day of this one day's exposure to about half the population of, of, of Muncie was, was that there's a, there's a subtle but really important threshold that people we, we, we were talking to had crossed. In many cities around the country that are struggling with, we lost this big factory, we lost this big economic base, we're trying to get somebody else there, there'd be discussion of, oh, what are the tax incentives? What's the abatement we can do? What's this or that? Very practical, sort of um, purely dollars and cents um, incentives. The next level up are the communities that which think, how can we make this a place people want to live? Where they feel as if, it's, it has an arts community and it has natural environment and, and, and that, that the same qualities that would attract Ball State grads to stay here, people who grew up here to come back, people from bigger cities to consider this as a home. We were struck by how often we heard your colleagues talking about what can we do to make this a really attractive community. And, and to build off of your comment about the fact that people use the word blessed, one of the things Jennifer and I both have traveled quite a bit one of the um, things that we think is distinctive about this community is how many people have expressed gratitude. It exists on our campus, it exists on our community, and it's maybe a variant off of that same word, that notwithstanding the challenge that we have, we have the good fortune of having some assets and resources to meet those challenges. So let, let me talk then, uh, ask a question or raise a topic about a, a specific issue. How important is it to have a vital downtown even in a city the size of Muncie. And, and you talk in your book, I think it's um, in Allentown, Pennsylvania, about public-private partnerships that help revitalize the downtown. And specifically, if you would comment on how they're both substantively important, but also in terms of just the energy or enthusiasm, and the message and spirit that it creates in a community. Here are two big historic trends we were impressed by over the years when we were traveling around the country. We can tell you later details of where we went and, and that sort of thing. 
One was the way in which a lot of American cities still have a lot of the historic, wonderful patrimony of the downtown architecture from essentially the end of the, from after the Civil War until the beginning of World War II. You know, that 80 or 90 year period where the classic American downtowns were built. Some of those have been raised some with a Z. Some of them have been covered with aluminum siding. Some of them are now tattoo parlors and things like that. But there are, there's a lot of that still left in the United States. And all around the country, you find cities like this finding ways, okay, we're going to revive this, this downtown. So that's one historic trend. America built this kind of downtown, and a lot of it is still there. The other historic trend we saw is that if the cliched American dream of the post-World War II era was move to the suburbs, get a station wagon, live on a cul-de-sac, be away from cities, there's a different kind of American dream now of younger people and some older people wanting to live downtown wanting to work downtown, wanting to have, have walkable amenities, amenities, not wanting to have a car, wanting to have all sort of the life of downtown. So probably the most common thread we saw among cities that, that had some kind of spark was having the young people come downtown, having retail and entertainment and, and uh, residents and, and, and businesses. There was one, both in Allentown and Erie, Pennsylvania, crucial turning points for the downtowns were when tech businesses decided we're going to move in from the office park suburbs and have our, our offices downtown and uh, you know young tech people wanted to work there and live there and all the rest. And, and another interesting thing about the downtowns were the number of times we saw in these main street renovation areas how, how towns would deliberately install some kind of public art that spoke to the identity of the town or the history of the town. For example, in Greenville, South Carolina, which has you know, this, this main street that went from, you don't dare go there, because it was, it was so scary and, and fraught in the evening, to you can barely get yourself down the sidewalk now because the throngs of people are there. But one thing they did was set a series of um, bronze statues along the town, starting with Max Heller, who was their first mayor, who had this kind of vision for the main street in the downtown, and proceeding kind of through the steps of history, um, ending up with some little mice. I, I, the story, the little mice is, has to do with a book that somebody wrote about, that's a beloved book in Greenville uh, that all the kids like. At any rate, the effect of that was that People like us who would go there or people who lived in Greenville would, would see these statues, they'd stop for a minute, they'd read the plaques, and then they'd linger. So by the time you were on the main street, you had a sense of that you were there with not just the shops and the mixed use business and, and a restaurant, but with other people who were thinking the same thing and recognizing the history of their town and acknowledging certain points, good and bad but kind of taking it in on a different level. And, and I think that those public arts, sometimes it was bronze statues, sometimes it was murals, you, you name it, all kinds of things, um, really gave people an excuse to be there and be with the other people in the town, which, which built this kind of immeasurable sense of, of the core of a downtown and why it was important. And so maybe this is a related question. It's certainly, this is going to be descriptive of Muncie. Um, and, and so the topic is, how much should the community be focused on supporting local entrepreneurs versus national chains? And again, I think our community is probably not dissimilar. Those chains tend to predominate on one of these main thoroughfares here. And we have the local entrepreneurs and businesses are downtown. What should the community view in terms of attracting both? What's the right balance to make progress? I think that, you know, the answers from that have, have to come from the town itself. I mean, we've seen a lot of different versions of this. And um, although they seem to be tending towards let the local people who know this town and want, want to pour their energy into their startups, if they're restaurants, uh, if they're if they're little boutique shops, if they're marijuana dispensaries, you name it. As we saw where that was legal. Right. Oh, yeah, that's right. Right. In Oregon. Okay. In Oregon, yes. In Colorado. All right. Yeah, I went there. It was kind of scary at first, but actually it was wonderful. It was kind of like a, the Ben and Jerry's of marijuana, you know, anyway. Um, 
Where was I? Okay. <laughs> so <laughs> so I, I was sick. I didn't go see this, but you you came back and say, oh, where was I? <laughs> yeah. So you know, what, whatever works it in the town that that might not work in Muncie. It's it's not legal, right? Right. No. Okay. So that we'll take that off the list. But um, in in Dodge City was a different example because Dodge City, which people probably remember from the gun smoke days. It's built, the main part of town is built like the, the little Williamsburg of Dodge City is, is the saloon and shootout uh, reenactments during the day and things like that. But immediately surrounding it are all of the, the um, familiar chain restaurants that you would recognize. And kind of infiltrating into that space are, is the, the microbrewery and the local distillery and the little sandwich shop and so forth, which people seem to be welcoming and, and wanting to place their personality mark on the town. Um, so the, the cha national chains are with us and ever will be, but the more happening a town was, to us, it seemed the more they tried to have their own local brands, and people were liking that, from restaurants to locally branded hotels, which are really a happening thing. So, so we're always going to have the chains, but, but uh, lots of towns are trying to have their own little stamp on things. So now I want to shift the topic uh, a, a bit. One of the recurring themes that you write about was communities that welcome and retain immigrant populations. And we're familiar with that happening in coastal cities, New York and San Francisco. But you write about that happening in places that are unexpected. Burlington, Vermont, Sioux Falls, South Dakota, Erie, Pennsylvania. What are those cities doing affirmatively that are attracting immigrants and helping to spur economic development? So I will start with, with my theory of American immigration, which I can offer because I've lived through most of American history now. And the, the Atlantic has been around for, have, for, you know, since 1857, really through most of modern American history. So my theory is that at every, so one part of my theory is from living overseas, I really believe that immigration is the crucial strategic asset the US has as a nation that we can use an outsized share of the world's talent here. So that, that's my, uh, 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 China can't do that, Japan can't do that, uh, other nations that are open don't have our scale. So that's, that's one premise I have. Second premise is that at every stage in American history, whoever is the most recent immigrant group has been somewhat disruptive, whether you're talking about Irish in the, 18, in the mid 1800s or Germans then or turn of the century Eastern European immigration or Vietnamese or whatever, it's always somewhat disruptive, but the genius of the United States is that over time we've been able to be e pluribus unum and, and make, um, make uh, apply this talent from around the world. And so our observation of the lived reality of immigration in most places where it's actually happening now in the US is very much in, in that, that model. There are disruptions, as there always ha has, have been, but a surprising amount of the United States right now is being transformed in a way that does not seem threatening to the locals by, by immigration from various places. Deb mentioned Dodge City, which is now slight majority Latino. Um, Erie, Pennsylvania, 10% of their population is refugees. You know, not just immigrants, but refugees, and that's a lot of the entrepreneurial spirit. Um, the, the, Muncie is actually unusual among Midwestern cities in having a relatively low immigrant population. And I don't know enough to know why that is, but that, that's one of our day one observations. And so there seems to us, seem to us to be the more immigrants were present in the community, the less threatened the community seemed, seemed to be by them. One story I will give. Um, so we, we wrote about Dodge, Dodge City a number of times in the Atlantic with the argument that the mainly white business and political establishment there was trying its best in a positive way to absorb and, and be, um, you know, make a new future with its now um, Latino majority. And some of you may have seen right before the midterm elections, there was a story about how Dodge City had moved its only polling place north of town, away from where most of the Latino voters were. So we called up our friends there and said, what's this? This is so different from what you said. And 
the, the people we spoke with in Dodge City said that was the state and county government that did that. And the city, when it heard that this, uh, the polling place was being moved, the next day, the all white members of the city council passed a resolution saying, number one, the city will provide free door-to-door -door transportation for all citizens of Dodge City on election day to wherever the polling place was. And number two, the mayor put out a statement saying, we in Dodge City are proud of the community we are becoming. And we want to make sure that all members of our community have the, all the essential rights. So, so the, the lived reality of immigration seemed to me consistent with America's, um, much more consistent with American history than with the current tone of national debate. And there were three towns that took us by surprise because we were least expecting it as far as the refugee populations yeah. and how, how the actual current refugees were fitting in. This was Sioux Falls, South Dakota, uh, Burlington, Vermont, and Erie, Pennsylvania. Sioux Falls has 10% of the public school population is refugees. Um, Erie, Pennsylvania, 10% of the entire population of the town is refugees. And the, you know, the way this started was, was really with the religious communities. Back in, during the Vietnam, the in, influx in the 70s of, of Vietnam refugees, um, the religious groups in town still to this day, Lutheran services, Catholic charities, other multi-religious groups were responsible for taking in and resettling those first waves of refugees. And they got really good at it. So wave after wave would come in. And each time, as Jim said, it, it's a new, a new challenge because people are different colors. They have different cultures. Kids have gone to school or not gone to school. They've come from war-torn places or they've been political refugees, you know, one by one. Um, so, Sioux Falls is a, it's an interesting example of this because it's, it's, um, it has right now a lot of Muslim refugees. And a lot of the women in the Muslim families are working in the pig slaughtering factory in Sioux Falls. This is the job they get, and, and this is the job that no one else wants, and this is the job that they do. In the schools, they, it, it often, the, the adjustment of the town to the different waves of, of refugees comes in, for example, in the schools. And in the, a recent example from Sioux Falls was that the teachers noticed that during Ramadan, during the fasting season, the kids would the Muslim kids would be sitting in the cafeteria with everybody else watching them eat and thinking, this is not a good situation. You know, these, these kids are undoubtedly hungry and they're watching their classmates eat. So they just simply decided to set up a separate room where, where the Muslim kids could go during lunch hour, be with themselves and kind of get through that hour when everybody else was eating probably hot dogs. Um, <laughs> and, you know, there were a hundred examples of things like that training for the police department in Sioux Falls when if it was a culture that as are many where where people are coming from if you get pulled over by a cop for do, for some infringement you might whip out your wallet we used to, I used to do this in Malaysia when I get pulled over regularly and <laughs> for just being me you know same same thing um, and show that I had 10 ringgit in my wallet which was a two dollars um, and it worked, but it doesn't work here, obviously. That's not a good thing to do. But training the police that people will do that and how to deal with it culturally rather than in some other way, those are the kinds of minute-by-minute -minute challenges that, that these towns are on the alert for to deal with. And, and uh, I guess the effect has been in Sioux Falls, for example, it's become like where the second wave of settlement goes because a lot of the refugees end up at the first stop, maybe New Jersey. And then word gets around, hey, Sioux Falls is really the place to be. So they'll, they'll go there as the second city because it is, it is welcoming and they are welcomed there. Yeah. I thought if you were from New Jersey, the next place was the Poconos. <laughs> <laughs> so when you met today, we're, I want to talk about education. And when we met today with the new uh, school board for the Muncie Community Schools, Jim Williams, who's the president of the school board, shared that uh, at a recent visit that the school board paid to Northview Elementary School, yeah. the students in that elementary school greeted the school board in five different languages. 
And so I want to talk about education. That is obviously a very important theme throughout your book. Uh, we here in Muncie are engaged in new partnerships from, from cradle to career. Um, and you certainly saw programs of all types. It's probably self-evident why education is important. So maybe if you could transition to maybe some of the most creative or innovative schools or academic programs that you, uh, that you experienced. So do you want to start, or what, what, what do you, how would you, how would you like care. us to do this? Yeah. Let, me, let me talk about San Bernardino, because okay. we, we wrote a lot about San Bernardino in Southern California. It's in the Inland Empire, as it's called. Great name. And next door to Redlands, California, where Jim grew up. Um, we, had, we had done a lot of reporting in San Bernardino uh, several years ago, and then went back just recently, this past fall or spring, whenever this was, Re uh, in January, recently, in January, <laughs> yeah. Um, it's been a long year. Well, we haven't been to Bend in, in between, right? <laughs> no. Yeah. OK. So um, San Bernardino is a kind of famously bankrupt town for a whole lot of reasons. They, they, they are having, they lost the Air Force Base, they lost the rail yards, they moved the highway, they lost other big manufacturing, and things were in dire shape. And the school system was having a lot of problems. Um, so in the last few years, uh, the school system in San Bernardino decided that they were going to make, essentially make school more relevant to the kids because there was a graduation rate of about 60%. I know there is a lot of skepticism around the sheer numbers of how do you count graduation rates, but I'm going to just say it anyway because this is, you know, it is some measure of something. And they felt they, a lot of kids were not graduating and they had to attack this. Got to keep these kids in school. So there was this, a deliberate effort to do a bunch of different things, get the kids onto pathways with certification for nursing or emergency medical or um, law enforcement or automotive or robotics. Get them in, into that as a, as a kind of career path by the time they ended up from high school, they, were, they had done internships and they were ready to enter the workforce. Even more impressive that there was a school called Arroyo Valley High School, which again had a uh, you know, graduation rate of really low. They um, developed an, the entire, they called it wall-to-wall -wall community, where each kid would be in one track, if it was robotics or, or high-skilled construction work, where they had to really ramp up into the technical education that these days support the kind of new version of familiar workforce, workplace areas. So each kid was in a track, learning very technical high skills. And combined with that were the regular gen general education subjects, English, math, science, whatever it was, that, that were redesigned to fit directly into whatever track that they were in. So if you were in automotive stuff, you learned the kind of math that was relative, relevant to working on those cars. A couple interesting things about that. One is those kids stayed in school. They told us, OK, that the graduation rate was 98% from 2010 well, to 2018. It was, it was way <laughs> higher. And, and um, the other interesting thing was that they felt that these kids who were graduating from that school, they had built a good system and it was becoming very successful and they were feeding them into, into high skills employment or preparing them for pivoting quickly to some other kind of uh, where they could apply those skills because they had also taught them the soft skills around it. The problem from them now, the next stage of problem was finding a good match for teachers because they had to build up the teaching staff base either to um, up-train the traditional teachers to give them enough familiarity with the high skills in automotive that they were teaching these kids because they weren't automotive workers themselves. Or they had to find a way to, to um, gather the people who had experience in those industries and train them up to be teachers to teach those specific classes in a, in a way that was like a good teacher. So matching the people to the teaching staff was what they were seeing right now as the second challenge in what they had seen as a successful school model. 
question. My version of, of applying what we've seen with possible relevance to what you're all doing here is that there were two enormous surprises, at least for me, over the last five years of seeing schools. One is, uh, as Deb was saying, all this innovation in career technical education, which is happening all over the place, and which uh, I had not paid any attention to, but it was, it was predictably and repeatedly the most interesting thing happening in a lot of, of, of school systems. We have a chapter in our book about Camden County, Georgia, and the way they had this school where everybody goes through one of five career tracks, and it really is, is exciting. There are kids in these, you would think of as fairly ominous seeming high schools who are building solar powered cars for races, or they're, they're, they're trained, they're certified as nurses when they come out. So the career technical education revolution, we think, is, is a real thing. The second is, the crucial role of community colleges around the country. Of course, America's research universities are the commanding heights of international competitiveness and all the rest. And of course, a liberal arts education is the best thing you can do. But I ended up thinking that community colleges were, were essentially the crucial connective institutions at this stage of American economic history of, for the opportunities, connecting people who need opportunities with the opportunities that now exist and trying to you know, mesh those gears. So we ended up thinking there are problems all over the country, but there are these two areas of real uh, ferment and experimentation and innovation and renewal too. And you heard today in one of the conversations with our, uh, our school board about the uh, relationships and partnerships they're building with the community colleges here in our community and in our state. And you saw the construction of our new Ivy yeah. Tech facility downtown. So when we think our, about ourselves being fortunate or blessed, yeah. uh, we think we have that platform. So let, let me ask you uh, another question. Um, one of the things that was interesting is when in your travels you spoke to the mayors of the cities and towns. And these were very successful elected officials. And you asked them, well, so what's next? Are you going to run for Congress? Are you going to run for governor? And to a person, they shared that the most meaningful and most impactful elected office that they could hold was to be the mayor of their city, that that was the highest office that they wanted to hold. So we're going to elect a new mayor in this November. <laughs> So tell us what, what attributes that you saw out in the community that we should be looking for in our next mayor. Um, the Atlantic has as a founding motto written by Ralph Waldo Emerson when we were founded in 1857, of no party or clique. So of course we take no, no position on any, any, uh, any elections locally or, or otherwise. But the reason why so many mayors seem to be so um, uh, satisfied in the jobs they did. I recognize that in the state of Indiana, there's an exception of a mayor who is aspiring to, to higher office at the, at the moment, but why uh, somebody who we know and, and actually, uh, actually like. Um, the, the reason why being a mayor may be the most satisfying form of elective office right now is we all know the frustrations of national politics right now. No matter what your partisan outlook, you can't feel very good about the ability of the national government to match the great resources the U.S. has to the great problems the U.S. has. There's no, no match at all. But in many cities are set up to allow a mayor to reach reasonable compromises with people of different points of view, to bring together institutions, whether it's universities or companies, uh, to have these public-private partnerships, and crucially, to make long-term plans and to imagine they might be carried out. Now, I don't, are, are there term limits here? I, I, I don't know. So we've seen a lot of places where the absence of term limits has been great for mayors and allowing them to say, okay, 15 or 20 years from now, here's where we're going, and either I'm gonna try still to be around and see that through, or some of my, my successors might be, but uh, I, I think that, that a mayor who is willing to say, here are the challenges of the community. What's the way we can make long-term plans and have reasonable compromises? I will vote for such a person, or I'll vote for all of them, if there's several on the ballot. Deb, who are you for? <laughs> <laughs> I don't dare go there, no. Um, but we saw this, we, saw, we met a lot of mayors, and we went, we've been to conferences with a lot yeah. of mayors, and one really interesting experience we had was in, in Greenville, South Carolina, a very conservative town with a conservative mayor. 
we were, there were several mayors coming to town and, and we were at this meeting and so forth. Um, in that, one of the mayors who came was uh, Miro Weinberger, who's the mayor of Burlington, Vermont, where you know the two parties are the Democrats and the Socialists. <laughs> it, it's that far. So we had the distinct pleasure of introducing these two mayors, um, Knox White from Greenville and Mayor Weinberger from, from Burlington, Vermont, to each other. They were, came from completely different political sides. And then we, we saw them get together, kind of talk about mayor stuff and what it took to be a good mayor, and had happened to be walking down the sidewalk behind them, like 10 steps behind them uh, at the end of that day. They were, they were arm in arm, you know, leaning toward each other, comparing notes on what it takes to be a good mayor. And, and sharing their secrets of mayordom. We, and we, I guess we thought at that, at that point that um, it's so much more about how a mayor behaves and crosses party lines and to get things done rather than being on one side or another as mayor. So since I've ventured into yeah. some sensitive topics, I'll keep going. Um, <laughs> One of the things that I, that I saw, that I read in your book uh, about your description of Holland, Michigan, was that uh, the community overwhelmingly passed a tax increase to support the transformation of their public schools. And at one of the quotes that I read in maybe another community, uh, one of the persons said, well, if we're not willing to invest in ourselves, how can we expect others to invest in us? So is it important? to generate additional local tax revenue to support these kind of programs and initiatives. I told you I was going to keep yeah. wading into the controversial. So, so, so well, of course, it depends. <laughs> so it, it's, uh, uh, there was a, we, we spent a fair amount of time in Columbus, Ohio, and I had a long description of the former mayor, Michael Coleman, who was the first African-American mayor of Columbus and who was mayor in 2009, when of course the economy there and every place else was collapsing. And he was describing how the crucial political battle he won with the support of Columbus's business community was to have a very substantial tax increase on the citizens of Columbus in 2009, when they're all losing their jobs and having their mortgages be called, because the alternative was to have these really draconian cuts in police forces and, and just everything else that made Columbus a place they wanted to be. And he, there was a successful uh, bipartisan effort to pass a big tax increase on themselves in 2009 in the teeth of the, uh, the quasi-depression that was underway there. And we, we, we chronicle a lot of other places that did something similar. We're able to say, we can see the importance of this investment. Uh, Dodge City, Kansas had a, a fairly large tax increase. A levy it voted on itself too. And so I think it, it, it depends on local circumstances of people feeling this is a justified investment. It's part of the, this, the community's future. We know and trust the people who will be in charge of seeing this, this venture through. But certainly you can find um, there are more examples of communities that did themselves harm by saying, no, we can't afford to invest in <clears throat> the downtown, in the police, in the school system, in the parks, and anything else. <clears throat> and, and they sort of began a deteriorating cycle. You can find more of those. That, and um, Excuse me, Deb, will you talk for a moment? Right. Yeah, I, I, I'm not going to finish Jim's thought, but um, I, I did want to talk for a minute about Charleston, West Virginia, where we saw a, a targeted effort about a, a library bond. The library was really failing, and this is a town that relied on the library incredibly strongly for to make up gaps in education, especially for the youngest kids, to help the teachers who didn't have enough resources themselves to be a source of, of access to, to technology because so many people couldn't afford computers or Wi-Fi, et cetera, et cetera, and down the line. We were there, uh, happened to be a voting day of 2014, and, and Charleston was, is still in trouble. But um, they were hard pressed to vote through a levy to support the library. But they did it because they rec recognized that there would be so much more lost in all of these other efforts if the library went down than if they supported the library. And, and we were back again this summer 
and saw that you know, not only had this work, but they were about to expand the library and, and build this extra new wing because it had been so successful and proven that way. So yes, thank, that, 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 is, that is right. So here's the way I round off this point. Americans, in our experience, recognize in their personal lives, their company lives, and their community lives the concept of investment. There are ways in which you can put some money done, down now, and five years from now, 10 years from now, you will, you will reap the rewards. So the outlier right now is our national politics, where everybody is sort of suspicious that any investment will be hijacked by their political opponents. So it's harder to invest at the national level, but still many communities we saw thought that investment of various sorts would pay off and was worth making the sacrifice for. Okay. So I've got a couple more topics, but that means in just a few moments we're going to give uh, you an opportunity to ask questions. So we'd ask you to think about those questions, and then we're going to ask you to come to the microphone here uh, to ask those questions. So as you begin to formulate those questions and maybe... If you're interested, begin coming to the microphone. Uh, let me retreat to a couple of safe topics now. Um, talk to us about the importance of fostering arts and culture. Uh, yeah, this is both wonderful and difficult to talk about because it's, um, we are really evangelists to this move. We're not artistic people and didn't really appreciate the, the deep textured value of arts in, the com in communities until we started to pay close attention to it. And now we're embarrassed that it took us this long to figure it out. So trying to talk about it, you know, it's hard because it's vague. It's hard to measure. Um, but we, we've seen, for example, um, arts give, give a chance for people to civ participate in civic life. They're like an excuse for people to get together in um, and bring a different perspective to whatever issue people, it is people are talking about. And did you know, in St. Paul, Minnesota, there's, there's an artist embedded in the planning commission just to bring a kind of new perspective and, and way to get the citizenry involved like through the side door because people love to, to participate in artistic adventures. So they, they, they're an excuse to get people to come together. And here's one little story of something that happens. Bend, Oregon, which um, switched, decided that they were going to substitute their X, T intersections with roundabouts. And this was, was some, OK. The same. Yes? Are you with me? So um, this was a fraught civic issue because people don't like change. They were worried about the emergency vehicles careening around through the, and people would get crashes and get lost, and et cetera, et cetera. So one of the things they did was to say, OK, we're going to end up with this green space in every roundabout. Let's get people involved talking about the roundabout issues by way of what kind of sculptures should we put in the middle of these roundabouts. So they held a contest, and local artists submitted their things, and they put them in the library for people to go and vote. And um, the first one was a little bit of a disaster because they voted on something that was called um, Rising Phoenix. And it was almost this two-dimensional giant metal thing that people started calling the flaming chicken <laughs> <laughs> because it was kind of abstract. Um, and yet, it got people talking, just this artistic installation in the town, and got them more engaged. And so the end of the story, yes, they, they installed all of the roundabouts. People became happy with them. The sculptures got a little different and more acceptable. And, and now, to this day, people will use that as a, I live by the, where do you live? I live near the flaming chicken. You know, it's this <laughs> point of pride. Of, of what's going on in the town. So that, that, that is just one of many, many artistic things. Uh, yeah. okay. my, my brief addition would be that we are surprised by how much people care about where they are from. There are parts of the country where you're just living someplace that's like within the LA conurbation or something or New Jersey. Um, but most places, you know, there's a real mark that people are from a certain place and the arts are a really important part of that. Anybody here been to Fresno, California? Fresno is not the most stylish part of California, but part of their artistic transformation now is this thing called the Rogue Festival to make themselves into the Bohemia 
of California, and to go from being Fres no to Fres yes. Uh, there, uh, you know, that, that it's, uh, there's, there's a zillion other illustrations. We, we have a, a chapter about how a country, or, or a, the singer Larry Gross has used his mountain stage program on NPR to really give Charleston a sense of itself and national things happening from Charleston. So I'm much more of a believer of art being part of how you know where you are from and that you're proud of where you're from. Okay, so again, if you would start, those of you who are interested in asking questions, to start to make progress towards the microphone. I know many of you yeah. in the room. Yeah. I know you're not bashful, so please, please come. An another safe question. You can go uh, and just pull us those, yeah. too. Okay, right. we're, we're okay. tough. Yeah. We another, have, another, we another safe question. You know, uh, as I read the book, and particularly as I got to the end, uh, the 10 secrets of success, and it was actually 10 and a half mm. secrets of success, and I really appreciated the half secret, which is that the half secret is you have to have a vibrant local brew culture. Yeah. <laughs> so, Jim, this might be more in yes. your wheelhouse. <laughs> yes, Deb can talk about the marijuana. I will talk about the, 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 the brew pubs. So, so number one, a point of local pride, local to me as opposed to local to you. Uh, the person who is the actual founder and, and, and the kind of creator, uh, the George Washington of the craft brew industry in the United States, is it Jim Cook of Sam Adams Brewery? No. Is the people who founded New Albion in California? No. It is President Jimmy Carter, my one-time employer. As part of his move that deregulated the airlines with all the mixed blessings that have come from that, he also deregulated home brewing. And so the, and everybody in that industry will say, Jimmy Carter is the man who made this possible. It's, it's an actual serious thing we saw around the country. There are several hundred thousand people employed in the craft brew industry uh, at relatively high uh, median wage. It's classified as manufacturing, so go figure. And it is a real marker of, again, localism. Uh, one other historical point, in the 1800s, Every town had to have a brewery. They had to, of course, but because there was no refrigeration, it didn't travel, so you had to make it yourself. After Prohibition, the concentration of the industry was such there were only about 30 or 40 breweries in the U.S. by, by the 70s. It was all just these big mega brews, uh, breweries, and now there's six or 7,000 of them. And so it is a sign of local vitality, which I understand applies here as well. That's right. <laughs> we had the good fortune of hosting uh, Jim and Deb for dinner last night, and it was St. Patrick's Day. Yeah. So we procured a, from one of the local breweries some local Irish stout for, for, <laughs> for dinner. Uh, so please, Jim. This is just for the sake of clarification. Several times you were talking about Erie, Pennsylvania, and the refugees. Could you give me a better definition of what you mean by yes. the refugees? I have a, I remember my parents talking about the Hungarian revolt in 1956. I lived in a city that had ethnic neighborhoods and we had a Hungarian neighborhood and thousands of these people came over after that revolution. Those sorts of things where there's vast so, influx of one yeah, group of so, people? So, so thanks for asking. So the question about refugees, since the time of the Vietnam War, there has been a very technically clear definition of a refugee. You know, immigrants, as you know, come in large, uh, large varieties, but refugees have to come in through an official program. They're classified by the U.S. as refugees. They are processed through a certain number of centers. And so the main refugees you find now are from Somalia and Sudan and uh, Nepal and Congo and Burma and some from Afghanistan, Syria. but uh, Syria, there's a lot of them. So we're talking about in, in Erie, there are 10% of the whole town's population are official refugees. Uh, Dodge City has a majority Latino population, mainly immigrants, but hardly any refugees except a few Somalis. But um, uh, this, the Twin Cities area in Minneapolis, uh, Erie, Burlington, Sioux Falls, half a dozen other places have a lot of, of, of official technical refugees. Could you talk about the importance of vibrant local newspapers? Uh, okay. Yes, yeah. indeed. So, uh, yeah. yes. So part of the character of a town, one of these, the, 
the ingredients of civic success that I talk about other than, than breweries is people who know the civic story, what the past of the city is, what its presence is, where it's, it's leading for the future. And so civic voices of every kind matter, especially local media. And so, so the, the situation of local newspapers is really important. And we, have, we saw around the country a few anomalous success stories, a, a couple places where local newspapers were able to buck the tide and become commercial successes. Uh, for example, in Vermont, a former alt-weekly called Seven Days is now essentially the newspaper of the state of Vermont. Vermont has the scale to do that and the consciousness and all the rest. And there's a few other illustrations. But generally, the pressure on journalism in general, newspapers in particular, is especially hard on local newspapers. And we saw that every place. And so number one, yes, this is a very important part of civic consciousness to recognize, revive, and protect. Number two, there's a tremendous number of experiments underway in trying to find a different economic model for local newspapers, whether it's being based with universities, whether it's combining uh, broadcast outlets like public radio stations and print publications, whether it's alt weeklies and dailies. There's all sorts of other models underway. But point three, uh, if anybody in the audience is a giant philanthropist or even a mini philanthropist, uh, I think that, that a, a, the next area of important NGO and philanthropic support is going to be local media because your money goes so far there. Uh, reporters are surprisingly cheap. And it's just, it is, it, the, the money it takes to, to keep reporters going, it goes really far when applied in local media. So I think you see more and more of large uh, foundations are saying local media is something they want to, they want to invest in. And, and one of the ways it goes far is, is on the kind of Peace Corps model, that there's, there is something now called Report for America. So a lot of young people are going out to do like Teach for America, except yeah. being, as being reporters, and that's really cheap. And, and yeah. older people too, it's sort of okay. an equivalent of like, um, well, well, anyhow, yeah. the, the anyway, in, in, innovative too. models. Mm -hmm. oh, yes. Gail. Thank you for joining yeah. us today. Um, my question is, I recently read a piece in the New York Times, an op-ed column, where a young woman wrote about how she had moved back to her, her small town. Yes. And it was kind of the name of the piece, yeah. Go Back to Your yeah. Small Towns. And so I just wanted to ask you and your travels, what did you see in terms of people who were in their late 20s, early 30s, coming back to some of these towns like the ones you visited in cities? And what were they saying to you if you had some of those conversations about what was drawing them back to want to live there? Oh, thank you for asking, and your free beer awaits you after, after this, this session. So, so can I give my yeah, answer yeah, to that? You sure. can, so um, here, is my, here is my big picture answer setting up specifics. Big picture answer is that as long as modern society has existed, ambitious people have concentrated in the metropolis. And so all of American literature is about people going from the farm to the village to the small town to Chicago, to New York, of people in Europe going to Paris and London, et cetera, et cetera. That process goes on, and you see the results in San Francisco real estate prices, and you see them in Brooklyn real estate prices. But it was amazing to us how often we saw the reverse of people who thought, yeah, I have worked in San Francisco, I could work in London, I've been to college in Chicago, but really where I feel I am from and I like to be is Greenville, or Nashville, or Duluth, or Fresno, or Redlands, where I'm from in Southern California, or some other place where you feel there's this imprint of place and community. Your money goes so much farther in terms of real estate. Uh, traffic, you know, traffic destroys our life in DC. Traffic, I think, does not destroy your life here, despite the scramble intersection, which is in all of its horrors. Uh, that, uh, so, so I, and we, we saw lots of people, that there was somebody I quote in, in the book, um, sort of in the same line as that New York Times piece, a guy who had worked in San Francisco, I think for Google, and moved back to a small place in North Texas saying, if you want to consume a great community, you move to Paris or Amsterdam or, or uh, Manhattan, with air quotes, if you want to, you know, that you can go to some place that's all set up, but if you want to create a great community, you go back to your hometown and you, you have that kind of engagement. So 
people keep moving to Seattle and New York, but we, we heard lots, we saw lots of people who were saying, actually, Muncie is where I'm from. That's where I'd like to be. Yeah, and, and they were actually unapologetic yeah. and not defensive about these. Yeah. One was a, a young woman from Columbus, Ohio, Ohio and she, she had a food truck. Okay, it was a food truck, but it, was, it got like award-winning food truck. And she said she had been in San Diego trying to cook her Korean, whatever, fusion food, and Californians just didn't get it. So she was going to go back to Columbus, and, and she's a huge hit there. That's where she was from. There's a young filmmaker in Charleston, West Virginia, who had been in L.A., and she said, you know, I'm coming back here because this is where I'm from, this is where my family is, I know it better here. I can do the same kind of filming, making films in my hometown better than I could in LA. They were, they were very specific and had often gone to another place and become successful or whatever and then said, I have a reason to go back and I can do it there. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Hi. Okay. So earlier you were talking about the importance of, of workforce development and, and sort of specialized training and education and, and that, and of course, that's of critical importance and we see that particularly as economies are shifting to um, more, more creative technologies, sort of high tech type of, of stuff. Um, I'm a storyteller. And it seems to me that uh, when we're talking about the differences, too, between what happens on a local level versus a national level, I'm really interested in empathy. And particularly as a teacher here at the university and on how to foster empathy, how to teach it in my students. And I'm curious, uh, how do you see the role of the humanities in this uh, a sort of new re rebirth, renaissance of uh, the American town. So, so would you like me? So, um, here in this session with Indiana Humanities, we are particularly um, uh, glad to talk about this this theme. So, my academic background, quote unquote, uh, is is in in American history and literature. Debs is in linguistics. We are humanities people. The Atlantic is part of the. American humanities tradition. And so I guess when we were speaking about the arts, we meant the humanities too, of, of essentially ways in which people understand the world in other than purely dollars and cents terms. They, they can see, they can imagine themselves in other people's shoes. They can imagine themselves in other people's skins, which is a very, very important thing for Americans to do. They can see the universality of struggles and successes and heartbreak and, and all the rest. And they, that almost every, uh, the reason I think um, everybody should study American history in particular is to see that every problem we have is both familiar and a little bit different. You know, you can see every problem we're having now is like the late 1800s, 1800s but different various ways. So uh, yes, we're all in favor of the humanities. And so people, the schools we liked and praised had good career technical programs, but also those kids were in there learning history and English and poetry. And, and I'm going to go a little lowbrow on this, because I think even the word humanities is scary to a lot of people because you think, I can't be hum a humanities person. Either I don't have, I, I can't go to college for that or whatever it is. But uh, it, it, and the arts is the same thing. If there's a way to make it more accessible, and I'm going to key in on your word of empathy here. When we were traveling around, um, every place I went, I went to the YMCA to swim, to swim. And there was usually a YMCA, and I almost always went there. When I developed, the word empathy is huge in my mind from the YMCA. Anybody can go in there. And when you're in there, you naturally run into people you wouldn't normally socialize with or see on the street or run into in a restaurant or wherever else it is. And we're, when, you're, when you finish swimming and you're in the locker room naked <laughs> next to other people, you develop this sense of empathy because you see all kinds of people there and you, you see their problems. And, and some of them go there only to, to take a shower because that's the only place they have. So um, I, I think going to the YMCA, being on the trail walks, 
um, going to the public library and mingling with the homeless people, any of these public places and public institutions where you have an opportunity, everybody has the same opportunity to mix and mingle with people who are not like themselves and develop naturally this sense of empathy is a kind of backdoor into the big word of humanities and arts. Can I go even more lowbrow? This is for any of my fellow reporters in the room, or our fellow reporters in the room. The cliche for reporters wanting to mix with the average people is to go to a diner, which has become this tremendous cliche. No, you should go to a YMCA or a library. Those are the two great American small-D democratic um, locales now. Those are where you can see a whole range of the country. So there. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, Bruce. Hello. Uh, I know 10.5 was uh, crowd pleasing, <laughs> but number 10 was in your book. You remember what that was, and it's about planning. Yeah. Uh, I'm talking about the long range plan yes. uh, that's um, intergenerational in some communities, and mayors uh, come and go, and they all pick up the mantle on implementing the plan. Good example is Indianapolis, starting with Dick Luger. Portland is another one in terms of Oregon, in terms of a 50-year, 50 50-point 50 plan that ended about 45 years since its inception. Um, you talk about willed optimism, and I think that fits in nicely with number 10 for this. Um, could you expand on that? Because only at the local level do we have plans. Yes, yes, and I believe I, the way I put uh, point number 10, I have it here, but I, I, will, not, I will not cheat. I think it says, uh, you can tell successful cities um, make and carry out long-term plans or some, something like that. Essentially, my point was, in national politics now, there is essentially no long-term planning because nobody has any illusion that can be carried out, whereas cities have the audacity to think, well, let's, let's envision what our downtown might be like in 20 years. Let's envision what our water supply will be like 30 years from now. Let's envision what the generation now in kindergarten will be like uh, when they're in the workforce, when they're raising children. And those, th this is, um, a lot of these plans don't come true, but just as business plans don't and human plans don't, but if you have an idea of where you're going, you're more likely to get sort of in that, in that direction. Uh, we were in Columbus, Ohio a month or so ago. They have now a 100-year plan of what Columbus a century from now what will be. Um, Redlands, where I'm from, has this idea of, of a sort of sustainable water situation for Redlands in the long run. So that is, you're right, that, that this is something that has all just about disappeared from our national life. But this, at the, the local level, that seems to be the place where it can be best, um, best done. And that's, so that's where the leverage is now. And I can get that, yes. I and I, I just wanted to add that, that lest we sound too positive about everything we're saying, there's also a dark side to this. And there are dark side problems that we saw everywhere. Everything you've heard about, and we can start with opioids and drugs. And the long term, we also saw towns thinking, OK, maybe not in my lifetime, but let's make a start. What are we going to do? Have drug courts, have, have the rehab centers, have long-term care. In Charleston, West Virginia, there's a women's center now where women are ex who are in the process of rehabbing are expected, they expect they'll be there at least 18 months in, in this center. And the statistics right now, like 38% of them or some very low percent will actually succeed in getting through this and getting back into the system. But the towns are, are also facing these bad problems as well as good problems and thinking we got to think long term about these two. Yes, every place we went had serious problems. San Bernardino, really serious. We know Muncie has a million problems. We'd learn about more if we were here. The question is direction and whether people feel as if they're moving in the right rather than wrong direction. And our, our message is more places than you would think believe they're moving in the right rather than the wrong way. So we have time for one long question or two short ones. <laughs> we'll get so shorter answers. We're going to do short ones. Yeah. Okay. I have no idea. <laughs> so 
you've been to a lot of different places and based on your descriptions from these different places, some of them have been, been incredibly diverse uh, with many different kinds of peoples and cultures, um, racial and ethnic groups, and some more homogeneous, some much more diverse. And the thing that I, I hear a lot about in looking at places with diverse groups is they either self-segregate or in where they live or historical artifacts of past abuse segregates them and they've not broken out of that yet. How do you get to long-term plans that require a cohesive community when your people are self-segregated and each segregated community has their own issues and their own priorities? What examples do you have of places that have been faced with that and have been able to create a cohesive sense of community in spite of or because of their diversity? So this is not a short answer form of question, <laughs> but I'll, I'll give you a, a short just for the moment answer. Let's stipulate that the historical American crisis, sin, and problem is, is the legacies of slavery and that the historic American challenge is of e pluribus unum, of trying to find to do what has been too difficult for other societies, having a society of, of, of many peoples. The, again, the question is directional. I think the smaller scale a city is, the harder it is to self-segregate. And, and because, uh, you know, Chicago is of a scale where you can have really stark segregation, Milwaukee as well. It's harder to do that in, in Redlands or either of those a north side and a south side. So yes, this is the historic American burden and challenge. We found ways, probably most strikingly in the South, of people trying to have face-to-face -face, <clears throat> face discussion, discussion, artistic, educational, other ways to bring people together. Longer answer later. <laughs> yeah. One more question. Sure. Yeah. Thank you. I'm very proud that I encounter so many people in this community who volunteer their time, treasure, and talents to improve the quality of life for others. Um, whether it be for the benefit of people living in poverty or to beautify public spaces. And I wonder how you um, found volunteerism in the other communities that you visited. I'll, I'll do a little, a little one, and okay. then you can, you can have yeah. your big point at the end. <laughs> but, 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 yes. Okay. Uh, uh, yes, uh, we saw all kinds of volunteerism from in Jim's hometown again and uh, the biggest, the most popular volunteer program in the public library it was adults teaching literacy to other adults. Um, it, maybe my biggest point of this would be to say that this is a, I would say this is an American trait. That America, it, we found a lot of good things about how Americans behave they collaborate, they're inventive, and they're generous. And I would say volunteerism goes into that category of being generous. From the littlest level, like being a Cub Scout leader, to, to the biggest level of anything that's happening in this town. So, uh, Since Muncie looms so large in the history of American sociology, I'll, I'll make a sociology point that over the last generation, there's been a lot of literature about Americans sort of losing all their civic connection and civic fiber. Our, our reportorial, not social science impression is that that view may need to be updated. There's lots of sort of reinvented, you know, the bowling leagues of Northern Ohio may be on the decline, but actually hipster bowling is coming back and <laughs> other sorts of, of connection are, are coming back. And we, saw, we have heard about a lot of about it today. I'll make one other point on the optimism point. There was a guy who won the uh, Nobel Prize in economics a uh, month or two ago who was saying that he liked the idea of conditional optimism. Um, conditional optimism is different from complacent optimism. Complacent optimism is the idea that things will get better. Conditional optimism is the belief that things can get better. And so we've heard in your town about the conditional optimism on a range of fronts, and that message is what we're trying to convey about the rest of the country, too. So I'm going to ask one last yeah. question along the, those lines. Yeah. Um, one of the challenges for any community is the length of time it takes for these yeah. investments. And I was inspired by 
the land preserve mm -hmm. project in Montana yeah. and reading the people speaking about that and you can share that example. It reminded me of a, of a proverb that I think exists in many cultures that it's a, a wise and generous person who plants a tree, the shade of which she will not live long enough to enjoy. Do and it's yes. yes. So the have you ever, any of you heard of the American Prairie Reserve in Montana? It's a very ambitious. Uh, the, the the idea behind it, in brief, is there were four zones in the world of more or less undisturbed grassland, the way it had been, you know, from time immemorial. One of them in Kazakhstan, one in Chile, one someplace in Mongolia, and one in Montana. And so this is a long-term effort to restore a, an area of land comparable to the Serengeti to its status before Lewis and Clark, uh, bringing back the fauna and the flora and everything else. And it's a very long-term project because it involves working with some of the, the native tribes there to have, have their, their cooperation. It involves dealing with some of the ranching families to say that when they die, they'll be willing to stop grazing their land and it will be turned over back to the buffalo, et cetera. And, and so the people who are working there, it's a Silicon Valley entrepreneur, a guy who grew up in Montana, went to Silicon Valley, had his career there, and then came back to Montana and saying, in Silicon Valley, everything was now, 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 now. Can you make a deal by 6 p.m. tonight? And he's doing something that his great-grandchildren, he hopes, will be able to say, go, go to the land and this is the way it looked when Lewis and Clark were there and for millennia before that. So. Um, in a less grandiose way, we've seen people planning for 10 years from now or 20 years from now. And so that spirit, I think, still exists within uh, people around the world and people in the United States. And so we're trying to say, yes, this is happening around the country. And the more people are, are aware of it, the greater the prospects for it to, to prevail. Deb. Deb, you will get the final word. Yes. Uh-oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, golly. Um, OK. Continuing along with this theme, we, we've seen other examples of um, financially well-off people buying up parcels of public land in, uh, in California, this point conception, which is kind of where Santa Barbara makes its turn and goes up. How many thousand acres? Uh, it's 35 um, square miles of coast land. $165 million. $165 million of land, d giving it to the Nature Conservancy. The nature, Conservancy. nature Conservancy for in perpetuity that that land stays there under their auspices and is untouched. And this was as a result of kind of having to grab it away from some developers who were going to not do that with the land. So that is like patience, that is forever patience. Yes. Thank you. Please join me in thanking <laughs> Deb and Jim Fowler. Thank you. We'll give you even more opportunity to applaud for them, so, so don't despair. On behalf of Indiana Humanities, I'd like to say thank you again. My name is Molly Martin. I'm with New America Indianapolis, and I want to thank you for attending. I want to thank Jim and Deb uh, for their excellent commentary as always. We're so proud to have them as part of the New America family. But I especially want to thank Ball State for being a tremendous host tonight and all day. So can we take a moment to thank Ball State? I would also like to thank our friends at Ruoff Home Mortgage for sponsoring the tour. We're so grateful. I'd like to thank Dr. Mearns. Jeff Mearns has been a tremendous host and also a tremendous facilitator tonight. So thank you. As you heard earlier, immediately after the event tonight, you can purchase a copy of Our Towns and get your copy signed by Jim and Deb, and that will be just out here where you entered. Um, the book signing is just as you leave, but we'll ask that you sit tight after we're done here in a moment. Uh, by Friday, you'll get a follow-up email from our friends at Indiana Humanities with a recap of some of what we learned tonight and a photo uh, from the event. 
Uh, tonight's event was the kickoff, as you heard, of Inseparable. And this is a new two-year thematic theme from Indiana Humanities. And this invites all Hoosiers to explain how we relate to each other across boundaries, real or imagined, and consider what it means to, in fact, be inseparable in all the ways that matter. And we hope that you'll continue to engage with Indiana Humanities and New America. But I want you to check out Indi Indiana Humanities' website to learn more about the rest of the tour, learn more about the incredible programming that they do. And you can find that at www.indianahumanities.org. And I want to thank again Ball State, Dr. Mearns, Ruoff, and I want to ask that you have a wonderful evening. So one more round of applause. The Law Office of Delk McNally provides legal services to individuals, businesses, and governmental entities. The attorneys at Delk McNally pursue effective results for their clients. Their team represents thousands of people and companies across the Midwest in state and federal courts. Delk McNally, large firm experience, providing small firm service. Delk McNally Attorneys at Law are proud supporters of programs on WIPB-TV. For over 20 years, Dr. Leland C. Wilhoyt has provided dental care for the entire family. Dr. Wilhoyt and his staff continue to offer dental service, including same-day one-visit crowns, implants, dentures, teeth whitening, veneers, smile makeovers, and same-day emergencies. A smile is a great personal asset. Dr. Leland Wilhoyt can help maintain and improve smiles. Proud to support dental health in our community and proud to support programs on WIPB-TV. Every day throughout Delaware County, our neighbors face challenges. But together, united, we change the game. With your help, we are more than fundraisers. We are hand raisers. We are stop talking, start doing, take on the impossible taskmasters. United, we find and invest every dollar we can into strategic, local programming that changes futures for individuals and families throughout our community. 